This video will cover all the higher level parts of C1.2 on cell respiration. In this topic, you're going to hear a lot about a molecule called NAD. And NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. It's one of the few molecules that you don't actually have to know the long term for it. You are allowed to use the abbreviation even in your writing. And it's an example of what we call an electron carrier. I love this term. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is a molecule that carries electrons. So another way of thinking about that is it is easily oxidized and reduced. So reduced meaning it can easily gain an electron and oxidized meaning it can easily then lose that electron or pass it along. Um, but in the meantime, it is a temporary electron carrier. Now, in reality, electrons don't come from nowhere and they don't go to nowhere. They're passed between molecules. So when a molecule loses an electron, that is called oxidation. But that electron doesn't just go into space. It is immediately gained by another molecule. That gain of electron is called reduction. OK, so the loss of electrons is oxidation and the gain of electrons is called reduction. And then those two processes happen simultaneously. So anytime you have the movement of electrons from one to the other, something is getting oxidized and simultaneously something is getting gained. You may have heard that or someone is gaining electrons. You may have heard that referred to as redox, those oxidation and reduction reactions um, occurring simultaneously. Now, there are a lot of things that go along with redox, and if you're also taking things like chemistry, you'll learn a lot more about this. From a biological perspective, it's important to keep your eye on two things. Where is the electron and then where is the energy? So in general, these electrons are going to be carrying energy. So if you're gaining electrons, I want you to think of that as that molecule is gaining energy. If something is losing electrons, we can think of that as it is losing energy. OK, so just something to keep an eye on as we move forward. In this topic, we're going to take cell respiration and break it down into four major steps. So those will be glycolysis, the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, which goes along with chemiosmosis. Let's first talk about this glycolysis step. So this is the very first step in this respiration process, and I love it because it's exactly what it sounds like. Glyco means sugar, lysis means to break, so I'm literally breaking apart a sugar. And this is going to occur in the cytoplasm. We're not in the mitochondria yet. And it is anaerobic. So that means that it does not require oxygen. And it's going to happen with a series of enzyme catalyzed steps. The net products, and we'll draw this in just a moment, at the end of glycolysis, I'm going to come, um, I'm going to end with two ATP two molecules of pyruvate, and two molecules of reduced NAD. So we're going to go ahead and diagram this out. I'm going to use these gray circles here. Each one of these represents a carbon. So I have a one, two, three, four, five, six, a six carbon compound glucose that we will start with here. And eventually I need to be able to break this in half. But the problem is that glucose is very stable. So before I can break it in half, I need to destabilize it. And I'm going to do that by adding a phosphate group. So I want to add a phosphate group to both ends here. And this is a step called phosphorylation. I'm literally adding a phosphate group here. Hmm, who do I know that has phosphate groups that I can borrow from? ATP. OK, so ATP is going to donate um, a phosphate group and it's going to become ADP. Now, I need two phosphate groups, which means I need two ATPs. So I have to spend two ATPs just to get this process started. Once I've done that, now this is unstable enough to where I can break it in half. And that process is called lysis. OK, so I've got two processes that I've done so far, all part of glycolysis. OK, I'm just working with glycolysis, phosphorylation, then lysis. 
And now we are going to go into the next phase, which is an energy harvesting phase. So there are two things that I'm going to get out of these intermediates. And by the way, you don't need to know the names of these intermediates, but you do need to know the steps and what we end up with. So I'm gonna go through two phases. And the first is oxidation. So this molecule is going to get oxidized. It's going to lose electrons, and that means something else is going to get reduced. And so what will get reduced is that molecule called NAD. NAD is going to pick up those electrons, and you can write this out um, either way. You can either say it becomes reduced NAD, or you can call it NADH, that's up to you. And this produces two molecules of this, okay? So I can reduce one molecule of, AD, or of NAD um, using this intermediate and a second molecule of NAD using this product. So that's the oxidation bit. Now, what we left out earlier on is that when this molecule actually breaks in half, um, it is phosphorylated a second time. Now, it doesn't use phosphorus from ATP just because of um, bonding reasons, okay? Um, the, it's able to attach an inorganic phosphate group to that molecule. But anyways, at the end of the story, and you don't, again, you don't need to know all the intermediates, each one of these actually has two phosphate groups. And that's going to be very important for our last phase, which is called ATP formation. So if I take a phosphate group off of this molecule, I can actually use that to turn ADP into ATP, okay? So I can make ATP this way. And I have one, two, three, four phosphate groups available. So that means I can actually take four ATP, or sorry, four ADP and turn them into four ATP. And so here's what I'm going to end up with in this process. I started out by having to use two ATP. So I'm two ATP in debt and I make four ATP in the end. Okay, so this gives me a net gain of two ATP in the process of glycolysis. What else am I making? Well, I am making two molecules of reduced NAD. So again, I can write that either way. I can either say reduced NAD or I can call it NADH, that's up to you. And then I have two molecules at the end each of these three carbon molecules is called pyruvate. So this is where we are getting these two pyruvate molecules. You may also see them refer referred to as pyruvic acid, right? But at the end of the day, I've taken a six carbon molecule and I've broken it down into two three carbon molecules and I've made a couple of other important byproducts as well. Now, in order for glycolysis to happen, I must have ADP and NAD. Shouldn't be a problem. If I don't have any ADP, that means I have a lot of ATP, and if I have a lot of ATP, I shouldn't be doing glycolysis anyways. There's no need there, okay? Now, if um, oxygen is available, that reduced NAD that we make in glycolysis is converted back into regular NAD during the electron transport change. So I should have a continual um, resupply of this NAD. The problem becomes that there is no oxygen available. So if there's no oxygen available, what has to happen is this pyruvate needs to get converted into lactate. And you may remember that's the product of anaerobic respiration anyways. And the reason to um, that our cells do that is because we need to regenerate NAD. So that reduced NAD or NADH, depending on where you're reading it, is converted back into NAD 
by donating this hydrogen and an electron to the lactate. And the whole reason why we produce lactate as a byproduct of anaerobic respiration is to regenerate the NAD that we need so that glycolysis can continue, okay? So in anaerobic respiration, we make two ATP and two reduced NAD molecules. If there's still no oxygen available, that lactate production uses the two reduced NAD, okay, and produces two NAD, um, and then we are left with just the total of two ATP. So if I have to do anaerobic respiration, the only energy um, products that I'm producing are these two ATP, and then that pathway then ceases. So let's do a quick summary of these different pathways, right? So in glycolysis, glucose is converted to pyruvate. That's universal, doesn't matter whether you have oxygen or not, okay? If oxygen is available, then the aerobic pathway will result in carbon dioxide and water be produ being produced as a byproduct. In the anaerobic pathway, so no oxygen, it really depends on what organism that we're talking about. Humans and some bacteria, they're going to produce lactate as a byproduct. We just talked about that to um, regenerate NAD. Yeast, on the other hand, aren't going to do that. They are going to do what's called alcoholic fermentation. It's a two-step process. Again, the whole goal is to regenerate that NAD so that glycolysis can start again. The end result of that is that yeast will produce two byproducts, carbon dioxide and ethanol. So one of the things that's tricky here is that yeast produce carbon dioxide, whether they are doing things anaerobically or aerobically. So that's a little bit tough um, to remember. But if we want ethanol to be produced, then we really have to make sure that we deprive the yeast of oxygen. Yeast is a facultative anaerobe, okay? So that means it can do both anaerobic and aerobic fermentation. It will always do aerobic um, respiration when oxygen is available, just because you get so much more ATP out of that pathway. So if we want to produce ethanol on purpose, you must deprive the yeast of oxygen. And that's important for two commercial processes, one of which is bread baking. So if you've ever done this before, you mix water and yeast um, and you let it ferment. And so that means that you're going to let it go through the process of aerobic respiration first. But once you cover it, you're going to eventually find that that yeast runs out of oxygen and it will switch over into anaerobic respiration. Either way, that yeast is producing carbon dioxide and you're gonna notice your bread dough getting bigger and bigger and that um, rise in the bread is caused by all the carbon dioxide that is getting trapped within the bread dough. Now, where does all the alcohol go? Well, it burns off during baking, okay? But one of the cool things, um, again, about yeast, and the reason why we're using it for bread is to produce carbon dioxide, and it's producing that both in the early aerobic stages and in the anaerobic stages later on. And the other commercially important use of this alcoholic fermentation is, of course, brewing alcohol, things like beer, wine, and other spirits. So in this case, you would want to take some kind of sugar, like grapes if you're making wine, grains if you're making beer, and you're going to add yeast and let that yeast go through the anaerobic pathway, that alcoholic fermentation, to produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. So this carbon dioxide will be seen as these bubbles here. Um, if you're going to produce alcohol, you need to make sure it's anaerobic, otherwise it will go through the aerobic pathway, and you need to let off the carbon dioxide, okay? So have some kind of a valve for this to escape. You can make quite a bit of alcohol content here, so the more sugar that you add, the more alcohol you're going to get, up to about 15%, um, and the limit there becomes because this alcohol ends up killing you the yeast. These make some really cool IAs, by the way, if you're interested in doing that. Um, and this, of course, is something that we can use to create alcoholic drinks or even biofuels, so some really cool implications there. So we're gonna switch back over to talking about the aerobic pathway, but before we do that, let's create a mental map of where all of these reactions are going to occur. 
So I, of course, here have a mitochondria. Mitochondria has an outer membrane, and it has an inner membrane with these folds called cristae. So the inner membrane is folded into cristae. On the inside of the inner membrane, we have this area known as the matrix, and this small area between the membranes is called the intermembrane space. So we've already talked about glycolysis, okay, and that is going to happen in the cytoplasm. We've got a few different reactions that we'll talk about next, one of which is the link reaction, so that is happening in the matrix. And then we have the Krebs cycle, and that is also happening in the matrix of the mitochondria. And then you have the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. And I'm drawing it like this because it really happens on the folds of the inner membrane, on these cristae. And it bridges both the matrix and the intermembrane space. So this is where I want to kind of remember that is happening. So let's get on with this link reaction here. You may recall at the end of glycolysis, we had three carbon molecules called pyruvate. Okay, that was the product of glycolysis. This link reaction takes place in the matrix of the mitochondria, so pyruvate is going to move into the mitochondria and undergo a couple of changes. So I find it easier to think about, and I'm just running out of room, it doesn't actually go down, but I find it easier to think about what's happening here by talking about or by envisioning what's going on at the end. So at the end of this link reaction, I should have a two carbon molecule with a coenzyme attached, and this two carbon molecule is called acetyl CoA. Okay, so that's the end product here. Well, what has to happen in order for me to go from this pyruvate to this acetyl CoA? Well, one of the obvious things is that one of these carbons has to come off. Okay, so one of these carbons is going to come off of pyruvate, and that is called decarboxylation. It's the removal of a carboxyl group, COOH, and it's going to come off in the byproduct form of carbon dioxide. The other thing that's going to happen, there are two other things that need to happen, one of which is I need to add on this CoA. That stands for coenzyme A. It's almost like a chaperone molecule. So CoA is going to be added in. And the last thing that I'm going to do is go through a series of oxidation and reduction. So pyruvate is going to get oxidized. It is going to lose electrons, okay? So think about if I'm breaking this bond, I'm gonna be losing energy, losing electrons, or liberating that energy, liberating those electrons. And that means that something else is going to get reduced. Pyruvate is oxidized, something else gets reduced, who do we know that loves to be reduced? Well, that would be NAD. So NAD is going to get reduced and it's going to form, you guessed it, reduced NAD. Now, remember all of this happens twice because at the end of glycolysis, I had two pyruvates. Okay, so at the end of glycolysis, if I had two pyruvates, I should be having two acetyl-CoAs, two molecules of carbon dioxide, two molecules of reduced NAD. And that acetyl-CoA is going to enter into the Krebs cycle. You may have heard this referred to as the TCA cycle or citric acid cycle. Um, the IB is pretty consistent with using the Krebs cycle. This is going to occur in the mitochondrial matrix, and it is a cycle. We're going to start and end with the same molecule, and there will be a series of enzymes at each step helping us to take apart that acetyl-CoA. I'm gonna be decarboxylating things, I'm gonna be oxidizing things, and at the end of this, I'm going to produce carbon dioxide, reduced NAD, reduced FAD, and ATP. So let's draw that out.
Here's my acetyl-CoA, and this acetyl-CoA is going to be attached to a four carbon molecule. So these green circles, each one of these is carbon. I've colored them a little bit differently just to, so that we can trace what's happening here, but they're all carbons. Okay, so a four carbon molecule called oxaloacetate is going to attach itself to acetyl-CoA then this coenzyme A is going to pop off. Okay, it's just kind of like a chaperone to help get this Krebs cycle started. And so I'll be left with this. Once that coenzyme A comes off, I now have a six carbon molecule. So I have my two carbons from acetyl-CoA and my four carbons from oxaloacetate. What we're gonna do is we're going to go through a series of decarboxylation and oxidation reactions. So when we say decarboxylation, we mean removal of a carbon, okay? And so that carbon will come off as a carbon dioxide molecule, and I will be left with a five carbon compound after this step. Now, I also said oxidation, so that part is the decarboxylation. This molecule, this intermediate, is going to get oxidized, which means something else will get reduced. What is the something else? Well, that's NAD. So NAD will be reduced to form reduced NAD. So I'm going to be able to form reduced NAD in between this six carbon and five carbon compound. Now we're going to repeat that process one more time. So we go through decarboxylation, we go through oxidation, and now I'm left with a four carbon molecule. Wouldn't you know it, it looks a lot like the four carbon molecule of oxaloacetate that I started with. And that's why we call this a cycle. Now, there are enough residual electrons still attached to this four carbon molecule that I can continue to reduce a few things. So I can reduce one more molecule of NAD. I can also reduce another electron carrier called FAD to make reduced FAD. And I can even manufacture one molecule of ATP. So I can also reconvert or regenerate ATP from ADP. So what have I managed to make in this Krebs cycle? Two molecules of carbon dioxide, one, two, three molecules of NAD, one molecule of reduced FAD, and one molecule of ATP. But don't forget that this entire cycle is going to turn twice per molecule of glucose because we had two pyruvates, two acetyl-CoAs, okay? So at the end of this, basically what we need to understand is that all of our original carbons that were in glucose are gone. They've all been picked apart, either in the link reaction or the decarboxylation reactions here in the Krebs cycle. So all of the carbons are gone. Where is all of the energy? It's in a small amount of ATP. Okay, so we made two in glycolysis. We'll have made two here in the Krebs cycle, one for each turn of the Krebs cycle. So I've got four ATP, it's not a ton. Most of the energy after the Krebs cycle is being carried, carried by those electron carriers. So I've got a bunch of reduced NAD now, I've got a, some reduced FAD, and those electrons are going to carry that energy to the final step in the cell respiration process. So let's figure out where we are in this diagram. If I take a look at this mitochondria, um, what I've done here is I've zoomed in on a space that's maybe like right here, okay? So I'm looking at the inner membrane, that's right here, and right above it is the intermembrane space, that space between the inner and outer membranes, and right below it is the matrix. Embedded in this inner membrane, are a series of electron carriers. Um, they are easily oxidized and reduced. So what's going to happen is something like reduced NAD, or it could be reduced FAD, it doesn't really matter, is going to donate an electron to these electron carriers. 
When it does that, it is no longer reduced NAD. Now it is just regular NAD again, okay? So in reduced NAD has been oxidized and this electron carrier has been reduced. It can also pass that electron to the other electron carriers, okay? In which case, every time it loses an electron, it becomes oxidized, gaining an electron, reduced, so on and so forth. Now, every time that electron gets passed from carrier to carrier, that's going to liberate some of the energy from that electron, and the energy from that electron is going to be used for active transport. So embedded within that membrane, we have proton pumps that are going to pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. So every time that electron is passed, protons are going to be pumped into the intermembrane space. Okay, again, that is then going to be passed to the next electron carrier and the next electron carrier, so on and so forth. Every time that happens, protons are going to be pumped into the intermembrane space using active transport. That's what that energy is used for. Now, the intermembrane space is very small, so that is going to create a high concentration gradient of protons, and that will be very important in just a moment. For now, let's go ahead and highlight the difference between reduced NAD and reduced FAD. The electron that is carried by reduced NAD has a little bit more energy. It has enough energy to pump 10 protons into that intermembrane space, whereas reduced FAD only has enough energy to pump six protons into that intermembrane space. But at the end of the day, what's important to understand is that the energy from those electrons is being used to pump protons into the intermembrane space. I have that going upwards here, okay? It doesn't matter. Remember, I could have drawn a portion of the mitochondria down here, in which case the intermembrane space would be down below. So how do we differentiate We're using our eyeballs? Where is the matrix? Where is the intermembrane space? Look for the direction that protons are being actively pumped. They will be actively pumped into the intermembrane space using the energy from the passing of that electron. So what we just talked about was the electron transport chain, right? The passing of that electron. That is coupled with a process called chemiosmosis. So chemiosmosis is the movement of protons from a high concentration to a low concentration through ATP synthase. So we actively pump them to get them into the intermembrane space. Now they are going to move via facilitated diffusion through this very special intermembrane or transmembrane protein called ATP synthase. Okay, so this ATP synthase is a protein that does two different things, okay, and it's what is right here. It acts as a channel protein for the facilitated diffusion of those protons. It also acts as an enzyme to catalyze the conversion of, oh, my of is missing here, of ADP to ATP. So when these protons, I'll show you again, when these protons are moving through ATP synthase, it actually turns a part of that enzyme and that kinetic energy can be used to convert ADP into ATP. Okay, so this is where we're getting most of the ATP in aerobic cell respiration is from chemiosmosis, the movement of these protons back into the matrix passively through ATP synthase. So here's a closer look. This ATP synthase molecule has a part down here that actually rotates. So as these protons move through the channel protein, this part rotates, creating kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy allows ADP to be converted into ATP. So we can phosphorylate this ADP, add on that other phosphate group. Now, the greater the concentration gradient of those protons, the more kinetic energy we have, the more ATP we can produce. 
So remember, reduced NAD can put 10 protons into that intermembrane space, whereas reduced FAD can only produce um, or can only provide enough energy to pump those six protons into that space. So that's going to mean less energy and less ATP produced. And I can see that I have this written the other way, so let's go ahead and correct that. FADH is how I would just write it. If I'm writing it as reduced FAD, I don't need this H, okay? They are synonymous, but let's just maybe fix that for now. So again, just to go back and make sure that we're clear, NADH is the same thing as reduced NAD. FADH2 is the same thing as reduced FAD. FAD, I would try to maybe be consistent and call them this, but aside from the naming part, um, what we need to know here is how these are produced, and it has to do with um, kinetic energy and rephosphorylating that ATP, and that I can get a little bit more ATP out of the reduced NAD compared to the reduced FAD. Now I wanna go back to that electron transport chain for just a moment. Remember, we've been passing this electron from carrier to carrier to carrier. And that happens when one molecule has a higher affinity for electrons than the one that it's stealing it from. Well, at the end of the electron transport chain, we've already used all the energy from this electron to power those proton pumps. So we have this electron left over and we need to do something with it. Well, that is the role of oxygen. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. And it makes such a good electron receptor because it has a very high affinity for oxygen. Now, don't forget that down here in the matrix, we've got lots of those protons, remember those hydrogen ions. Well, what do I get when I combine oxygen with electrons and those hydrogen ions or protons that we've been pumping? Well, you probably already guessed this. This is going to all combine to make water. So if we think about where things have come from here, the carbon dioxide byproduct of cell respiration has come from the deep carboxylation reactions in the Link and Krebs cycle. The carbon dioxide byproduct, or sorry, the water byproduct is coming from the electron transport chain. Oxygen is the final electron receptor here. It's going to capture that electron and it's going to combine with those hydrogen ions and that's how we are getting water. And that in fact is the only reason why we need oxygen for aerobic cell respiration. That's it. Oxygen's only role is to be the final electron receptor. Without oxygen, there's nothing to accept that electron. So all of the electron carriers stop accepting electrons because they already have them, which means reduced NAD and reduced FAD can't donate their electrons which means I have no way of regenerating the NAD that I must have for glycolysis. So if I don't have NAD, then after glycolysis making that pyruvate, I've got to regenerate NAD, which means I'm making lactate, which means I'm going through the anaerobic pathway. Unfortunately, that also means I'm making less ATP because I don't have the electron transport chain going. So the whole point of this is to, to showcase this idea of interaction and interdependence. The electron transport chain, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, link reaction, they all seem different and separate, but they are interdependent on one another. The electron transport chain requires those reduced FAD and NAD molecules, and glycolysis to start another round of cell respiration also relies on that as well. And so we need to understand the role of molecules within each reaction, but also how they allow all these steps to interact um, and work together. And we'll end this video with talking about what we can use as a respiratory substrate, okay? So when I'm thinking about what we can use for energy, we can use things like carbohydrates or lipids. Now they have different energy contents. So carbohydrates have about four calories per gram, whereas lipids have nine calories per gram. And the reason for that being is that in lipids, there are a lot 
of um, carbon and hydrogen bonds. And in carbohydrates, there's a lot um, more oxygen. Okay, so if you look at the components, um, carbohydrates are about a one to two to one ratio. We're not going to see the same ratio here. So these bonds are going to be oxidized much differently with a much, gener ener a much different energy content. Okay, all right, so let's maybe change this. Lots of oxygen. <laughs> okay, all right, glycolysis. Um, carbohydrates must go through the process of glycolysis first. So we have to go through that process of making pyruvate, then it can be turned into acetyl CoA. Lipids, on the other hand, do not go through glycolysis, they go right into that um, manufacturing of acetyl CoA. So they don't go through that glycolysis analysis process. However, lipids can also not be used for anaerobic respiration. Only carbohydrates can be used for anaerobic respiration. So there's some really cool opportunities here for investigating um, some rates of cell respiration and maybe checking out these different uh, substrates.